Uh, Open your Bibles, please, to Luke chapter 8. Luke chapter 8, and uh, we have been, actually, we've we've looked at a lot of things in Luke chapter 8 so far, but um, now after, uh, you know, the guys being swept up in the storm we saw a couple weeks ago, and then, of course, the demoniac last week. It's always fun to talk about the devil, isn't it? Um, (laughs) It's refreshing in many ways to talk about the devil, to realize how much power he does not have over our lives. Today, uh, we see them now coming across back over to the other side. And of course, the question is, may not be for you, but increasingly, I find for myself, for years, I've always seen this as the guys are now coming back across the lake to Capernaum, which is Jesus' base of operations. Um, Many people in in recent years have come to the conclusion that it was not Capernaum. I know this is not going to change your life. I'm just saying something to think about. Um, Those of you who've been to Israel with us are familiar with Magdala. Uh, Mary Magdalene came from Migdal or Magdala. And uh, uh, if you've been to Israel in recent years, you've probably gone to Magdala and seen the uh, synagogue that's been uncovered there, Jesus taught there, and it's really something to say. So, uh, but many people believe that this may well, this event may well have happened there. But, uh, so I go back and forth in my mind, and you probably don't care, and so it's a waste of time for me to bring that up. But we read this beginning then in verse 40. And so it was when Jesus returned that the multitude welcomed him, for they were all waiting for him. And behold, there came a man named Jairus, And he was a ruler of the synagogue, and he fell down at Jesus' feet and begged Jesus to come to his house. For he had an only daughter, about 12 years of age, and she was dying. But as he went, the multitudes thronged Jesus. And now a woman, having a flow of blood for 12 years, think about that, having her menstrual cycle for 12 years, not a cycle. She'd spent all her livelihood on physicians and could not be healed by any. In fact, Mark says that she suffered many things under physicians. She spent everything she had, and instead of getting better, she got worse. Mark just says it straight. Uh, She came from behind and touched the border or the hem of his garment, and immediately her flow of blood stopped. And Jesus said, who touched me? And when all denied it, Peter and those with him said, Master, the multitudes are thronging and pressing you, and you say, who touched me? But Jesus said, someone touched me, for I perceive that power has gone out from me. And now when the woman saw that she was not hidden, she came trembling and falling down before him. She declared to him in the presence of all the people the reason that she had touched him and how she was healed immediately. Jesus said to her, daughter, be of good cheer. Your faith has made you whole. Go in peace or go into peace. And while he was still speaking, someone came from the ruler of the synagogue's house saying to him, your daughter is dead. Don't trouble the teacher. But when Jesus heard it, he answered him saying, do not be afraid. Only believe and she will be made well. And when he came into the house, he permitted no one to go in except Peter, James, and John, and the father and the mother of the girl. Now all wept and mourned for her, but he said, do not weep, she's not dead, but sleeping. And they ridiculed him, or they laughed him to scorn, Mark says, knowing that she was dead. But he put them all outside, took her by the hand, and he called. Where'd he call? He called little girl Arias. And then her spirit returned, and she arose immediately. And he commanded that she be given something to eat. And her parents were astonished. But he charged them to tell no one what had happened. You see this painting. It's a, a recent painting. It's really pretty striking, whether you see it at Magdala, and it's, you know, it's pretty big, uh, or if you just look at this and study it for a while, just to... Try to put, and I know it's, in one sense it's hard for men to do that, I realize, but to put yourself in this woman's position and to see what's going on here. It's really a pretty striking picture. I asked Bill to leave it up while we're studying through this. Who is this Jairus? Jesus loves desperate people. We don't. In this room, we don't like desperate people. In this room, 
We like to be together. We like people who are together. We like it when, when you say, how you doing to someone? If we're honest, we really don't want to hear the truth. Well, I'm really hurting, and this is going on, and that's going on. It's like, just tell me you're okay. You know that. I mean, it goes through our minds. I'm not saying we all feel that way. I'm just saying that the, the reality is in our culture, because when it comes to those types of questions, we live in cliché. How you doing? Fine. In reality, there's something brewing inside everyone. And there's something about desperation. You know, we have our phrases, our cliches. Desperate time, call for desperate measures, don't they? But when it comes to religious things, we don't like desperation because desperate people do weird things. And that gets messy in church life. And yet, the Gospels are full of messy stories. Truth of the matter is that everybody's messy. Some of us might be messier than others, but those are seasons. Sometimes, you know, I might be messy at this point in my life, and you're not so much, but not tomorrow you might be. You know, that's, that's really humanity. That's the way it is. And we see this man, Jairus. Jairus is his name. So I always find these names interesting. Uh, I assume that this is his given name when he was born, Jairus. Yahweh will reveal. Yahweh enlightens is what his name means. Uh, Mom and dad could not have understood how that would take on this meaning in this story at this point in his life. Don't know how old this man is. I'm assuming he's in his, probably his 40s at this point. He's the ruler of the synagogue. He's not a rabbi. That's not what he is. He's not a teacher. Uh, it, it, it's hard to put him, you know, he, he basically, he, he's Eric. He's our Eric. He, he, he runs things here, you know. Yeah, Eric doesn't say much, but but. Nothing really works without Eric. Um, you know, that's kind of what Jairus was. Everything, everything worked because of him. He's the one who, who unlocked and locked the doors. He's the one who brought the Torah scrolls out from the Bema. He, that's what they call it. You know, he, 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 he was the one who moved everything around. He's the one who arranged speakers. He, uh, he probably, whether it's Capernaum or, or Magdala, he's probably the one who arranged for Jesus to speak a number of times. He was a rabbi, and so he, he uh, and, uh, arranged for Jesus to speak. Maybe, maybe in recent weeks he might not be doing it as much as he might have originally because he's becoming so controversial with Jesus. But uh, he would have been one of the most powerful men in the city, whatever city we're talking about here. Pretty powerful guy. He's married. He has one child. He doesn't just have a daughter. It's the, 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 the sense in the scripture is that his only child is a daughter, 12 years old. Something has happened. She's dying. Think of everything he's seen already in Jesus. I mean, he saw Jesus come into the, the synagogue and, and to cast out the demon from that man back in chapter 4 of Luke. He's, he's watched Jesus you know, cleanse leprosy or certainly heard these stories. Um, he has heard his teachings. He's been astounded just as much as the, the other people would have been impressed by the fact that you know, Jesus wasn't like the scribes and the Pharisees. He wasn't just quoting the Talmud. No, he was... He is the law. He, he was speaking the word that he authored, right? And so he knew that there was something very special about Jesus. Don't get the wrong impression. It's not that he was a believer as we would consider it, but he knew there was something very special about him. Probably, if he wasn't there, he was very familiar with the, the whole account with the man with the withered hand. He probably was very much aware, had to have been aware, of uh, the lame man as they tore open the roof. I, I tend to think it was Peter's house, but as they tore open his roof and, 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 and dropped this man in, didn't drop him, but you know, lowered him into the house, you know, he would have known about that. And in recent weeks, months, at this point in Jesus' ministry, Jairus also was very familiar with what the Sanhedrin had ruled from Jerusalem. That anybody who has anything to do with this rabbi from Nazareth will be cut off from Israel. So that's a big deal, especially when you consider his position in life. When you, consi cons when you consider his income, his, his status, 
his position in the community. But it's amazing how life will ambush us. It doesn't matter how much money you earn. It doesn't matter what your position is. It doesn't matter how many letters you have after your name. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. At some point, life has a way of laughing right in your face and saying, now deal with this. Your spouse walks out on you. Or it's that dreaded disease. Whatever, I mean, we can go down the list. There's always something. And suddenly you're confronted and you're beyond your depth. You can't grapple with this. You don't know how to fight it. And any child is important to a dad. There's something special, of course, about a daughter. Dads? Dads with daughters? You, I guess not many of you. Dad, dads with daughters? You know what I'm talking about? There's something, there's something about a daughter. I mean, really, don't get the wrong impression. I'm not saying not sons, but there's something about a daughter. The sunshine of his life. I mean, I can quote Dylan. I can quote little Stevie Wonder, too. But, but uh, you know, the... Now, at 12 years old, from being so, so full of life and being the joy of the home, what happened? I don't know, a fever? Started getting clammy, she's got a headache. Whatever it was, what do you do? Well, you know, put, get, get, a, get a wet rag and put it on her head. Try to take the fever away. What are you going to do? It doesn't matter. All your position, all your authority, all the things you know, what you do for a living, it doesn't matter. Suddenly, that one you love, and it doesn't sound like this is taking days, it sounds like it just happened that morning or during the night. And it's a very quick thing, an infection, a virus, whatever it is, and it looks like it's going to take her. As you, as you go through the different gospel accounts, one says that she's dead, doesn't say she's literally dead, but she's at the point. What do you do? What do you do in these situations? And I know I've asked this before, but seriously, I mean really seriously, consider this for yourself. And especially I ask men now, have you ever seen another man fall to his knees in front of another man? and beg, I mean beg. Better yet, would you? Now see, we're a together people. You have to be desperate to do those kinds of things. I'm not talking about going to a third world country and seeing someone begging for food or money or something, and that's a serious situation. But I'm talking about you, where now you're way beyond your depth, it's life and death. <laughs> and what did it cost him? He knew what it would cost him. He was willing to risk everything for his little daughter. And so he seeks out Jesus and he falls to his knees. He said, come to my house. And Jesus is willing to go. He's willing to lose everything for his little daughter. And of course, on the way, there's this woman. She had nothing. And she was desperate. You know, uh, church tradition, by the way, says that she once had something. Church tradition, and you can only do so much with this, but, don't, but at the same time, don't disregard church tradition. Church tradition says that her name was Veronica. Uh, in fact, it's the same Veronica, according to church tradition, who wiped Jesus' brow on the way to the cross. Church tradition. It's not Bible. It's church tradition. Church tradition says, for those of you who've been to Israel and you remember what it was like there, I mean, we're all familiar with Caesarea Philippi, but if you've been there, you get a sense of, ew, what it was really like, you know, the creepiness of the place, that she was from there. And that, according to Mark, you know, she'd spent everything. And on, on Doctors, Luke kind of gives the profession a pass. I mean, Luke's a doc. He says, you know, 
She spent everything she had, but we couldn't make her better. Mark, who's writing for Peter, says, no, actually, she got worse. And then she had nothing. Instead of getting better, she got worse. She was destitute. Now, the, the Talmud said that, actually the law said, that she could divorce her husband. Let's understand this. I think most of us in here know the basics, but let's make sure we're all on the same playing field here. Blood, to touch blood, life's in the blood, right? Leviticus 17, life's in the blood. But to touch blood is to make one unclean, okay, till the end of the day. And there's certain things you have to do. You have to wash a certain way afterward. You have to be alone. You've got to be away from your family, away from your friends. You have to wash your clothes, all, all these things. I won't go through it all in the interest of time here. But it was pretty elaborate. It was like being near death, right? If you, if you touched a dead body, do the same thing to you as touching blood. And here's a woman who has had her menstrual flow for 12 years. Think about this. Just try to process that. It's hard for men, too. I mean, I mean, I understand we can get the concept, but for women especially, her iron stores were gone. You know, I mean, the, the, the hemoglobin, everything. She's shot, right? She, she's fatigued. Uh, yeah, she's, she's totally weak. Uh, it's, a, it's, a mis it's a mystery that she can even get around, but she does. She has... Uh, According to the law, it was her husband was not permitted to touch her. And so the Talmud said that it was okay, Talmud, for, for her husband to divorce her. Twelve years. Presumably she's divorced. Don't know, but presumably. So her children, if she had any, she probably hasn't seen them in a very long time. No one's going to have anything to do with her. No one's going to reach out to her. Because this is a very legal, religiously legal society, and you're just not going to do certain things for people. She's got nothing. Desperate. Jairus had everything to lose by going to Jesus. She had nothing to lose. And we're, we're all pretty familiar with this. By the way, just to kind of close the loop on the story, her name is Veronica, according to church tradition, Caesarea Philippi. Uh, she would have had money, by the way, uh, this is not church tradition, this is just reasoning, in order to go to physicians. Uh, regular people didn't go to physicians. You can't afford them. Only people with money. So maybe she was like Lydia, you know, the seller of purple. She had a business. I don't, I don't know, but she presumably would have had some money in order to spend on doctors and not get better. But now she's got nothing. But tradition says that uh, after she was restored and she went back to Caesarea Philippi, uh, this is, um, I'll tell you the name of the uh, church historian in the second service. It'll come back to me. Uh, but uh, it'll come back. Maybe it'll come back before that. But uh, these things happen every once in a while. Um, I should have written it down. But anyhow, he says that uh, in honor of what Jesus had done, she she commissioned the, uh, the creation of a bronze statue of Jesus touching her, uh, and that it was on display in Caesarea Philippi. Now, some of you really care, and some of you couldn't care less. But anyhow, that's the, uh, that's the tradition. She's weak. She's, she's got nothing left, and nothing left to lose. How close is she to dying? She has to be pretty close, I would think. Unclean cut off from the synagogue, and in fact, I don't know, but depending upon who you really think she is, it may have been Jairus who cut her off. Oh. Eric, right? <laughs> it may well have been him who put her out. I find that to be pretty interesting how this all works out, but anyhow. She's been cut off from everything, she's homeless, She's weak. She's destitute. Dying, in my opinion. She feels like a leper. She doesn't just feel like a leper. In effect, she is a leper. I didn't say she's a leper. In effect, she's a leper. Because to come near anybody 
is then to make that person unclean, literally to touch someone. But people, if you get this close, going to be like unclean, like a leper. So she feels like a leper. She's treated as a leper. Isn't it interesting? See, the Talmud suggests, and therefore people like Jairus and the religious leaders and the common men and women probably would have considered her an adulteress, that this was her own immorality that caused this. The Talmud suggests that an extended menstrual flow is a, is a judgment from God, and it's a result of fornication. That's not God's word. That's the Talmud, man's word, that says that. And you can see how people would have come up with that idea. Isn't it interesting what sin has created? I didn't say that sin created her, men her extended menstrual flow. Sin has brought disease into the world. Sin has brought all this dysfunction into the world. You don't have to be, you don't have to have sinned a particular sin in order for something to happen to you. Man has this way of saying, and, and, and so many Christian movements will do this sometimes. You've got that cancer or you've got that sickness or the, because you don't have faith or because, or because of your sin. Oh, sometimes these things just happen. Yeah, there are... God will upbraid at times when we need it. Uh, he will... He'll take us to the woodshed when we need to be taken to the woodshed. She's a desperate one. What, what does your desperation right now cause you to deem to do? What does your desperation right now cause you to want to do? Deep down, there's something in <laughs> probably all of our lives, but certainly most of our lives, that we want to get straightened out, but we don't know how. Maybe it came out of a sin decision years ago. Maybe it's just a place we're at or someone else's sin and what it's causing us to do or causing pain in our lives. And she looks at this man. She's heard. You know, I, I could take you through it, but there's no time for that now. But all of the different things that doctors what, you know, what, the, what the medical profession of the day said that you did for an extended menstrual flow. I mean, the, uh, the synagogue had its rules and, and its suggestions of things that women could do. Uh, when you exhausted that, you could go, if you were going to spend, and you, did, you spent money on this, and you went to the doctor, and the doctor suggested many different uh, things that you could do, prescriptions, uh, including, uh, you know, find a, a white donkey, a she-ass, uh, and follow it around. Um, and when it had a bowel movement, um, find, find the seeds in it, remove the seeds, wash them, um, and then eat them. And if your menstrual flow was staunched in a day, uh, or if, or if, you, if uh, that was fine, but it may come back. If, it, if you got two days of relief, that was better, but it may come back. If you got three days, you'd be, you, were, you were healed. This, you paid money for this. She'd spent everything she had, and instead of getting better, she got worse. But there was another physician she'd heard about. <laughs> he doesn't charge. That's why he's the great physician, right? Um, but she'd heard about him. And he was thronged by people. She sees him. Now, Something possesses her to think. Something possesses her in her desperation to think, if only I could touch the hem of his garment. Let's just make sure we all understand that. Numbers 15 said that every man was to wear a hem. You know, when we think of a hem in our society, we think of something you do to a cloth to keep it from fraying. Um, in that society, the hem on a man's garment was similar to the chevrons, if you think of chevrons on, on, a, on an officer. You know, it indicated someone's status in society. Or if you think of uh, David uh, in the cave at Engedi when Saul was in there and, and he cut off a piece of the hem of, of King Saul's robe, 
he actually was diminishing Saul's status as king by doing that. That's part of the reason he grieved David uh, for doing that. Maybe more information than you wanted, but the, so the hem was an important thing. Uh, and, and the tradition of the hem is actually carried over into Orthodox Judaism today. Uh, but in, the, in that day, the hem was something that went around, of course, the bottom of the robe. And then there were tassels, four tassels. Um, one, uh, however, it were, kind of went over the shoulders then hung down toward, toward the ground, one to the right, one to the left, one in the back, and another in the front that you would throw over your back tassels. And these tassels all together, and they, they, they were knit together with the hem, but they had 613 little knots in them. Those, each one of those 613 knots represented one of the commandment, one of the misvot, right? And you see that today in Orthodox Judaism. You see these little strings hanging out from the bottom of an Orthodox man's uh, coat. You think, is, that, is his underwear hanging out? Like, what's going on with the guy, you know? Well, that's what it is. That's what they're called, the tzitzit nowadays. And um, she's thinking, if only I can touch the hem of his garment. Now, you and I, when we think touch, we think to touch. That's not what's happening here. What happens here, and actually the, the same word picks up uh, more information you need. Uh, the day of the resurrection, um, what does Jesus say to Mary? Don't touch me. It's not literally touch. He's don't hang on to me, is what he said. Don't hang on to me. I've not yet ascended to my father. Um, she hung on. She grabbed a hold of that tassel. How she did this, I don't know. She's an unclean woman. It's a mob scene. And somehow, it was that last desperate attempt, and she had to throw herself down on the ground to touch or to grab that tassel that was hanging from him. And immediately, Mark says she felt it happen. Immediately, it's not just that she stopped bleeding. Everything was better. You know, when Jesus heals... You know, when the lame man was healed, he didn't have to go to PT for the next three months, right? He was fully healed, right? She's fully healed, right? Her platelets, her, her hemoglobin, everything is back up where, where it ought to be. She's fully whole. And Jesus says, who touched me? And of course, Peter, you know, said, everybody is touching you. Like, are you kidding? The people are all around you. What do you mean, who touched you? He said, I... I know that power or virtue, he says, has gone out from me. And he looks around and he says, who touched me? I mean, busted, right? He, he looked at her, she knew it. Mark says that she told the whole story. She told it all. By the way, what's she thinking? She's thinking, oh, I just wanted to get whole. I didn't want to defile him, right? Because her blood flow would defile him. She's, 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 she's waiting for the rebuke, but she knows she's feeling better. You know, and she would have been content to have just quietly slipped away forever in debt to him. Now think about that. Many of us are like that, forever in debt. And yet to live her life then, thinking, I owe, I owe. And what might you do to disrupt that relationship because you owe him? And the crowd's waiting for him to say, who do you think you are? To do that to me. Now I got to go be alone for the rest of the afternoon. I got to wash my robe. No, because his purity quenched any impurity that she had. Her impurity couldn't make him impure. It's the other way around. That's the way it works. I know I'm taking a long time on this. I want to bring up the color because, you know, sometimes, well, I think we all often feel like Jairus, forgotten in the midst of all the excitement. Jesus looks at her and says, daughter, your faith has made you whole. What's Jairus thinking? Daughter? My daughter? 
My, you know who this woman is? Think about it. If, if it all went the way I'm thinking it went, sometime around the time that his daughter was born, this woman presented herself with a problem, and Jairus put her out of the synagogue. And he's known about her for 12 years. It's only a suggestion. I don't know that, but it could be. You know who this woman is? You know what she's done to cause this? And you're calling her daughter? What about my little girl? Jesus said, don't fear. Only believe. You can't believe while you're fearing because those two are opposites. You have to choose not to fear in order to only believe. And of course, you know the rest of the story. And in a sense, I'm cutting it a little short here. They go to the house, and we've all heard this so many times. But by now, she's dead. That's what, they, that's what the, the servant comes back and says, don't bother the teacher anymore. Your daughter is dead. And the mourners are always already there. Jairus has some money, so the mourners are there. They're doing their thing. And Jesus brings in only Peter, James, and John for reasons we can look at some other time walks into the room, and there she is, dead. Her color's gone out from her. Maybe she's already getting cold. And he said, don't weep. She's only sleeping. And they laugh her to scorn because they, they know this might be their third funeral of the day. They, they're professionals. They're around dead people all the time. They know what a dead person <laughs> looks like. Jesus puts out the mockers which at some point we also have to do in order to believe. But, and he says, and this is not abracadabra, by the way. Talita kumi is what we read in, uh, in Mark. That's not abracadabra. It's not a magic word. It's very simply talit, or little, little disciple, little, little girl, arise. It's just a command. He called her. Where did he call? Her ears don't work. But where did he call? The same place Lazarus was. I mean, she's gone. He calls her, and immediately she wakes up. Feed her. Don't tell anybody, which is one of the funnier lines in the scripture. What are you going to say? She wasn't looking good, but... Uh, <laughs> there are a lot of things you can say in, in all of this. I, sometimes I think it's better just to let, let it sit out there. This woman has been desperate for all these years. Jairus is desperate. They're very different situations. But Jesus, Jesus deals with them at that desperate point. Would she have come to him had she not been desperate? Would Jairus have come to him had he not been desperate? See, we have all kinds of rules that we set for people about when they should come to Christ. And there's no question. You should come to Christ now. That's why the Bible says, now is the time. Today is the acceptable day, right? But Jesus is perfectly content to wait for you to be desperate enough to realize he's your last resort. And he is your last resort. He's your last resort if you've never trusted Jesus before. Today, he's your last resort. You can try other things. You're just going to find yourself at that place where up against the wall, there's nothing else to do. You can find yourself broke, busted, disgusted. There's nothing left to do except come to Jesus. And then say to yourself, why didn't I do it three years ago? five years ago, 10 years ago. I'm looking at everybody, and I know as I'm doing it, some of you are thinking, don't be looking at me. <laughs> but I know, because I don't know your condition, but I know that that's the norm. This woman, whatever her name was, her, her desperation is what brought her to Jesus Christ. Jairus. His status, his money, his acclaim, all those things. 
it was his desperation that brought up Jesus. And Jesus is still the hope for the hopeless and the help for the helpless. He's the one when it's time for desperate measures. He's the one that you go to. For 12 years, many of, so to speak, many of us have had it just great. 12 months, 12 weeks, 12 days, 12 minutes, whatever it's been. For some, for 12 minutes, 12 days, 12 weeks, 12 months, 12 years, it's been horrible. Come to him. Yes, come to Jesus for salvation. But as we come to the table, we come to him knowing that he's the only one. He's the only one who can deliver on his word. Jesus has always delivered on his word in my life and in your life. And it's easy to allow communion to become yet another religious experience, but that's not what he intends for us. But rather part of the relationship, not religion, but this relationship that he's purchased for us with his own blood.